Okay, so we are recording and we're gonna get started. There we go. All right, so thanks for joining us. My name is Emma Gooch and I am the program coordinator at eCampus Ontario for our micro certification initiatives. I'm joined by my colleagues, Lena Patterson, who is the Senior Director of Programs and Stakeholder Relations, as well as Michelle Singh, who is our Chief Technology Officer. So Lena and Michelle are going to be monitoring the webinar throughout to answer any questions you guys have in the chat. Uh, and we're also gonna have a few breaks in speaking for anybody who wants to pop off mute and ask a question over audio. All right, so here's the agenda for today. First, we're gonna give you a quick background on what has led us to this project so far. Uh, and then we're going to get into details around the expression of interest. And we plan to leave a ton of, a ton of time for your questions uh, since this is a QA. and a um, We've been getting a lot of great questions to our procurement box and we're gonna go over a few of those and then we'll leave the floor to you guys to ask your great questions. So this year, our colleagues in government have asked us to continue our micro-certification work with three objectives and key results. eCamps Ontario is to drive the creation and use of micro-certification at Ontario colleges and universities. We are to deploy a micro-certification platform across higher education sector, and we are to host a micro-certification forum. And our work in this space has always been focused on province-wide perspective and system level thinking. So when we say system, we mean all of these things and more. We mean colleges and universities and workforce representatives all working together. We mean online blended face-to-face -face learning modalities. We mean continuing education programming and for credit programming. We mean French and English. And there are a lot of unique perspectives in this space. Our goal is to create the foundation that supports all of you to launch unique micro-certification projects in your context. And this pilot is the first opportunity for you guys to test consistency in frame and principle. But why micro-certifications? So we know that you guys are on this call because you see the value of micro-certs and that you're interested in running a pilot with us, with our support. So let's talk about why eCampus Ontario is working in this area. Like we, you, we know that the world of work is increasingly changing and dynamic, and that employers are moving towards a skill or competency-based based approach to hiring. And in response, government, higher education institutions, and employers have all identified a need for a more nimble system of skill and competency recognition, a system that is better suited to the environment and the world of work. And it's important that we tackle this as a system because we know that the micro certs that you create in your context need to have currency outside of your institution for it to have an impact on students. And truly tackling a systemic challenge like micro certification takes more than just one agency or one institution or one employer for it to mean something. So we had a forum in March, and at that forum, we put it out an open call to action to come together to think about a framework for micro-certification initiatives in the province. This invitation was open to everybody. And from this call, we led several facilitated sessions with over 60 participants representing many different institutions and employers. We had contributions come from 12 different colleges, nine universities, 10 employers, and five public sector PSE organizations. And this is the result of our work. So these, the principles and framework document was developed to provide high level guidance for micro certification pilots across the province. And it's an aspirational document and it's also a living one. So we are running these pilots so that you guys can test this framework in different contexts. And we'll share the findings so that you can, we can continue to develop a healthy micro-certification ecosystem that serves all of Ontarians. All right, so before I get into the details of the EOI, I'm gonna pause here for any questions you guys have about the principles and framework um, and the, our background in this work. You guys can either use the chat or you can come off mute to ask a question over audio.
So Emma, Deanna, it's Lena. Deanna is asking um, for examples of employers involved in the process. Um, so we had Deanna, uh, City of Toronto, IBM, Shopify, LinkedIn, um, a regional board of economic development. Um, we had the city of uh, Toronto. City of Toronto, we had Toronto Public Library. So we had a pretty diverse mix of um, of public sector and private sector organizations give their input. Does that help? Um, nonprofit and small scale. Um, I'd have to go back to my list to double check. Um, yes, we did. We did, did we, Michelle? Michelle? We yeah. did. I don't, don't remember the specific names of those organizations, but yes, we did. Yeah, it was a pretty good, uh, diverse, wide array. I mean, it was uh, it was an open invitation. So we, um, whoever was willing to come, um, was was welcome to come. So we were really happy to have the representation that we did have. Um, so the other question from Juanita is, are you looking for specific technical yeah. skills for the pilot or would soft skill micro certifications be approved? So if this question is premature, is the question um, premature in, in the webinar? I think we're gonna touch on that, right? Yeah, we'll touch on that. Um, but uh, the answer is both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so a clear definition and examples of what kind of credentials would be considered. Um, Lena, what do you think? So, I mean, I think Michelle and Michelle should chime in here as well. I think that this question is really um, up to our institutions. Um, this is a new space and um, what we're trying to do with this um, pilot is to give you some room to play um, and, some, and some room to experiment. The framework and principles that we, that we developed provide um, high level guidance in terms of um, relevancy to the job market in terms of endorsement from employers. Um, so I don't know, Michelle, if you have a, a example um, that you can share, uh, but I think that we're looking, we're looking to the sector to start to dream up some ideas based on the principles and framework that we've developed. No, I would say, I mean, I don't have a specific example to share, but I would say kind of a, a line to what you're saying is this is what the, um, the pilots are all about, right? Is to see this framework at play and how the framework can drive those type of credentials. And that will inform us in terms of what's considered a micro-credential or not. And I'll just add that in the, in the discussion that we had um, in the group, the question of the OQF came up, um, the All Ontario Qualifications Framework, as in, um, should we be um, aligning our work in this space to what already exists in terms of um, defining what these things look like. And the answer that came out of the group was, you know, this is emergent um, and this is something that is, that is worth exploring, but we'd rather not put the policies and definitions in place before we have had enough time to test the, the space. So um, at eCamps Ontario, we work a lot with the concept that, that practice should drive policy, um, not the other way around. And so that is, that is what we're really trying to enable um, with this expression of interest process. I hope that helps. Um, Emma, there's another question from Lisa uh, Coster as well, and we will be touching on that um, later on in the webinar as well about how many proposals um, can be submitted. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a question from Sula about relevancy to the job market. Is it specific to the local job market of the school? I mean, it's whatever uh, whatever is is meaningful to the students that you're putting through um, your program uh, in terms of their employability. Uh, going forward, I think that that could be at any of those levels. It could be regional, it could be provincial, it could be national, it could be global. Um, so we, we are not setting any terms um, in terms of scope of relevancy. I think that's really, um, that's really dependent on the project. 
And there's another question about uh, the definition of credential in terms of professional accreditation. Um, Michelle, do you want to take a stab at that one? I'm, I'm hogging the mic. Okay, he's not, he's not <laughs> up there. I mean, Jillian, I think that I think that we've been I think we've been kind of trying to stay away from this conversation about definitions until we have an opportunity to test some of this stuff in the space. So I think that um, that the that the partnerships that we're asking um, you to build in applying to this RFP could have absolutely include um, connection with a professional body. Um, they, they already do a lot of this work, um, but um, how deeply it is connected into the higher ed system, I think is something worth exploring. Hi, this is Dan from McMaster. Hey Dan. Just on that topic, I, I wanted to add something. I think that you know the, the relationship with professional associations has always gone back to courses that we've offered because we map competencies back to specific courses or vice versa. And, and that's just because that's what we've always done. They've never questioned that. I've recently had some conversations with some folks in the professional association area that would be open to a different model that would actually um, recognize competencies on a you know, uh, micro level. Um, and in which case, you know, you could recognize that with either a single badge per competency or multiple or multiple competencies for a single badge however you want to do it but the point there is that we've got a system that's there because it's the only way we've ever done anything nobody has ever questioned it and, and we've always sat back and said, well this is how we do things there's an opportunity now to look way beyond courses and actually accredit competencies which is really what most professional association programs are all about anyway that was a great answer Dan I should just pass all my questions yeah. up to you <laughs> that's great that was that was great um, Rick is asking if colleges and universities can collaborate on a micro-credential and submit a proposal. Absolutely, Rick. <laughs> that would be fantastic. We love, love collaborative proposals um, and we always encourage, um, encourage that kind of um, cross-institution work. Can um, I just so comment on another thing I see there? Go uh, ahead, Dan. Sorry, somebody was asking I guess about the credentials uh, and its established requirements, or how is this different from set credentials and its established requirements? So we, we've that's a question that comes up a lot here at McMaster, which is, you know, well, what does that do to the credential we already have? And it's not that you're necessarily replacing. I mean, you could at one point replace a credential. I personally think all credentials will be digital at some point, even if it's a degree. Mm -hmm. But what you can do, and maybe this fits within the realm of this particular project, is that you keep the credential the same way. You're not replacing it, but you find ways to recognize other skill sets. And somebody mentioned earlier soft skills. So there, there's plenty, every single program that we have that it, most institutions offer, you know, are recognizing uh, mostly hard skills, although there might be some soft skill recognition, but the soft skill recognition is probably the one that doesn't get recognized often. So there's an opportunity there. You keep the credential the same, you don't touch it, but you're also adding a digital credential to recognize something in the past has probably been lost. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. And I think um, M Michelle, if I'm saying your name correctly, I think um, that was my question around the uh, the requirement and and the credentials. But I think there is a follow up that I have also, and this is Varsha Nayak from the Regional Diversity Roundtable wanting to know what is what would be the assessment criteria around this or is there individual employers assessing individually on the whatever skill sets that they might want to review or look at that's a great question varsha and, and assessment um and evidence is that 
Um, what we're trying to do at eCampus Ontario is just provide that as a guidance to say, this is something you have to think about if you're going to pursue this work and ask our institutions and their employer partners or their industry partners to engage in that process together, whether it is what, you know, as Dan noted, something you're repurposing something that you already have or reframing it, or you're adding on um, a piece of assessment which touches on a skill or competency um, that you want to elevate or, or recognize. So um, for the purposes of this webinar and, and this expression of interest, um, that, is, that is what we would like to see um, from the proposals that we're getting. Okay, great. Um, just in, I'm just conscious of time here and we have a lot to get through uh, related specifically to the expression of interest. Um, so, and we have another, uh, another time for questions at the end. So I'm just going to keep moving on, but thank you so much. I think we covered a lot of great stuff there. Um, okay, so just move the slides here. There we go. All right. Um, so Surely you guys will have seen the expression of interest posted on our website right now. Um, and you may have also noticed that we've provided submission templates for you too. Um, and these templates just provide a helpful checklist of all of the criteria that we require in your application. So we highly encourage you guys to use these templates. So for the EOI, you guys can submit proposals in one of two categories. You can do creation of a new microcert program or an adaptation of an existing micro-certification offering. So a new micro-cert program means that no prior micro-certification exists for this offering. And this means that no program has been implemented. So it's possible that prior to the release of the EOI, you guys had met with your team and brainstormed possible projects, or you may also be in the beginning stages of creating a new micro-cert, but just so long as it hasn't been implemented, it's still gonna qualify for this creation category. So an adaptation of existing micro-certification offerings means that you already have a micro-certification program or maybe an open badge or any other alternative recognition of learning project and you want to take that program and adapt it to apply the principles and framework. So maybe you have an open badge program but it doesn't have a direct connection to an employer. Or maybe you want to update an existing micro-credential so that it's relevant to today's labor market. And this is an opportunity for you guys to take this framework and apply it to your institution's program to test to see what it might look like. All right, so now to explain the criteria for your application in a bit more detail. Um, we're asking that the skills and competencies that your project targets are clearly stated in the EOI. So these competencies and skills may be transversal or they may be discipline specific. Um, we've included this T-shaped graduate image so that you guys know what we mean when we're talking about uh, cross-domain skills and attitudes and vertical deep learning. Uh, we really want to encourage applications from either or both of these domains, and it's really up to you what project you submit. Um, you might have also noticed that relevance is the first principle in our document. We're asking that for either evidence or a description of how the skills and competencies are relevant to the labor market, both from the PSE perspective and from the employer. Uh, and just a note for adaptation projects, uh, there's an extra piece that asks you to identify which elements of your previous micro-certification initiative is going to be adapted to fit the framework. Okay, so we've asked for criteria related to an employer or industry partner connection. Uh, this is because in the working group discussions, um, a theme that kept coming up was this connection between higher education PSE and partners in industry. And the purpose of this pilot is really to take on aspirational work. Um, so we're asking applicants to include a letter of interest from an employer or industry partner. And finally, criteria on budget. Um, because our timelines are so short, we've included funding to support you in hiring a project manager or any other project support to assist you in getting this work done. Uh, we really want to make sure that you guys are successful, and we think that this is going to be really important. Um, we've heard from so many of you that you guys do this work on the side of your desks, and we really want to enable you and give you guys the capacity to get the work done in the timelines that we have. 
um, just one note that your budget doesn't need to include platform costs because the platform is going to be provided to you as part of the pilot. All right, so let's talk about those timelines. Um, successful applicants are gonna be notified at the beginning of November. Through November and December, we're gonna work with you to get your projects off the ground. And we'll also plan to meet with you early on to help us define the technical requirements for this platform. Um, we're gonna be running an RFQ to find a vendor to provide the platform throughout November and December, uh, which means that you will receive access to the platform in January. The pilot officially ends in March and final reports to us are due uh, May 15th with a midterm survey in or around, around March 9th so that we can get our year end reporting done too. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to the February 21st date. Um, this is gonna be our micro certification forum in Toronto. And we're going to ask our successful project teams to present their progress so far at the forum. Uh, so please mark it in your calendars now. We're going to be launching an official Save the Date campaign at TESS uh, in a few weeks with more information to follow. Registration will probably start in December and we're going to promote it heavily. So you guys will see it coming. Um, but just have that date saved in your calendars now. Okay, before we open the floor up to more questions, and I see that there are tons in chat, um, I'm just gonna go over a few of the questions we've received to our procurement inbox. Um, so we've, we've gotten the question a number of times of whether institutions are allowed to submit more than one application per institution. And the answer is yes. We invite our member institutions to submit as many proposals, as many applications as you can. Um, but because of high levels of interest, uh, there's like 57 of you guys on this call now. We had 70 people register. There's a lot of interest around this project. So that means that only one project per institution is going to be funded. And our applications are going to be evaluated separately based on criteria provided. Uh, one of the other questions we've had is, uh, but whether the micro certifications must be delivered entirely online, and that answer is no. Uh, micro certifications are, can be delivered in any format, whether it's online, blended, face-to-face, -face, um, just so long as it fits the framework, it's permitted. All right, more questions. Um, we're here to answer questions. Again, you can use the chat. Um, I know that there's a bunch that Lena and Michelle will get to, um, and, or you can unmute and ask a question over audio if that's easier for you. So Emma, there's a couple questions about scope. Um, I think that a lot of people have a lot of fantastic ideas about um, being able to kind of rig up a new program um, and, and, and create new courses in order to, um, to apply a micro certification approach to that. And I think that, um, that we are open to all, um, all of these ideas, um, but we are restricted by um, the funding cycle that we are in that is set um, by government um, because we are a government funded organization. So um, I, think, I think our best advice to you is just to think about the scope of your project um, and to think about um, the timelines that we have, have set out. Um, you would, you would, you, we would want you to be um, at least to the point um, by the time your project is over, by the time we hit March 31st, we want you to be at least ready to start intake and to start um, issuing those micro certifications. We understand that in the time that we have, you might not be able to start issuing those micro certifications right away, but we want you to get to the get to a point by the end of the project that um, that means that you're ready to start issuing in the next term. So um, just keep that in mind in terms of scope. This is short turnaround, um, and and we apologize always for that. Um, but it's it's just the reality that we work in, and 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 I think it's it's up to you to think about what can be accomplished and where the lowest hanging fruit is for you as an institution. I hope that helps, Debbie. I know it's I know it's a bit of a gray area. 
Looks like we have a question from Tara. Um, can the microcert be created for a specific employer to upscale their workforce? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great one. And I, and I think that we, I think that we, we would encourage you, especially if this is a new concept at your institution, we encourage you to start with something that's manageable. Um, just one institution, one, tar one target group, one employer. Um, I think that would be, that would, that would lead you, we would be able to, um, to ensure your success um, if you had a project scope that was, that was doable and achievable within the timeline. So that might mean pulling back a little bit on the ambition, um, but you're still trying to prove a point at your institution, right? Which is that, that, this, that this kind of idea has value and is worth pursuing in a larger scale. Yeah, and I mean, there's different workflows to do this, but one of the workflows I just mentioned in chat is the microcert could be issued by institution and endorsed by that by that employer. So there's there's different ways to look at this, but absolutely, we can, that's kind of the objective of it, right? Is to be compelling for the workforce. So building something for the industry is is something we're looking forward to, for sure. So there's an interesting question from Juanita in the chat about um, whether the microcert will be open source or the institution be able to own it. I mean, you'll see in our in our framework, Juanita, that we um, that we talk specifically about uh, about ownership of the um, micro certification uh, being the property of the earner. Um, so the institution, it does not have to be open source. Um, it, it, and it should be and 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 it would make sense to have it be branded of the institution. But but part of the principle that we have established in this in this framework which the expression of interest has to address is is the fact that um, the associated data is the property of the earner I hope that helps with that question hi it's Dan at McMaster I have uh, two quick ones uh, you mentioned pilot and date of March 31st so is it safe to assume that the the, the whole learning training experience has to be concluded by oh. that date. Okay, so, sorry, Dan. I think I answered the question in chat. I thought we were talking about training oh. about the platform itself. So I, I kind of answered yes to that question. So training on understanding the platform and stuff like that would be done before March 31st. That would be actual learning and student learning. I mean, um, and Lena, you might chime in, but I think the expectation is to get started in this space and being able to report early usage of the platform. I mean, will the whole learning experience be grabbed before March 31st? That I'm unsure. I think there's some space for uh, extending over that, um, although I'd r rather defer to Lena in terms of that. <laughs> yeah, well, I know that's the perfect answer, Michelle. I mm. think I think it's, I think it's, um, I think that we would be happy if by the by March 31st, if the institutions that were successful in this EOI were either um, were either actively issuing micro certifications to their students or had all of their ducks in a row to be ready to issue them in the in the following term. We understand mm -hmm. there's a lot of front end work that is required in order to execute on some of this, right? You have to talk to the right people, you gotta get the right people around the table. Um, and that's why we really, again, encourage you just to think about scope, the thing that you're tackling, what your goal is, um, and try and narrow it down and, and shave it down as much as you can so that you can get a quick win, um, even if it's a small win um, on your yeah. campus. And to that point, Lena, right? I mean, our, our objective here is to be able to report back to the ministry that there's activity in this space and that there's yes. many institutions um, working towards um, microcerts. So I think it's not about completion necessarily. It's about demonstrating activity. Yeah, okay. and, and exactly. that kind of leads. To, sorry, that kind of leads to my second question, which is: Perfect. Once you're complete, once you've gone through the whole uh, process there with part of your pilot. Uh, what does the assessment or the, the evaluation of the whole thing look like? What, what, what is it that you're going to be gathering to provide that report back? What is it you'll be looking for from us? You know, Dan, I would love to, I mean, like Michelle said, what the ministry is asking us to do is report back on increased activity. And so uh, I, I think it's, 
I think what we do in November and December is we work with the successful institutions to kind of co-design what those parameters might be that we want to report back on at the end. Um, so we, we feel confident that we'll be able to report back um, what we need to tell the ministry, but there's, a, there's another question, which is kind of what do we want to learn as a sector about this? And I think that is a question that I would like to engage the community on once we, once we have um, the projects lined up. Does that help? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm sure there's quite a few people that have some ideas. And yeah, I, well, I would think so. I, I saw there was another question um, um, from Charlene Smith in the chat about whether or not the framework um, whether the framework suggests that microcert must be transcriptable. And she says, can you talk a bit more about that? So Charlene, um, you'll see that we added where possible onto that element um, because we recognize the working group and the conversations that we had recognized that in some disciplines, especially probably in professional disciplines, um, the, the inclusion of that microcertification on someone's transcript will be important for them going forward into their career path. Um, but we also recognize that um, the systems uh, that are in place to create um, transcripts are, are extremely official. Um, and it will take some time in order for a microcertification conversation to start to trickle up um, to the registrarial level. So we made it optional. So it is not required, it is optional if possible at your institution. There's a question here coming from Sri, hopefully I'm, I'm saying this correctly, about criteria to follow for existing programs and adapting them. Um, I'll give you an example of what kind of what we're looking for in, in that space. Uh, there's a lot of, we, we, we know it's a scanning environment that there's, there's a lot of initiatives already underway. So co-curricular initiatives, for example, that are already established and running within some institutions. And what we would be looking forward to is seeing how these programs that already exist in institutions can, can work with the framework. Is there alignments there? Are we able to adapt them to work within the framework? So that's kind of the criteria. Is something that's already running within an institution, potentially co-curricular, maybe not co-curricular, and, and, and then testing that program against our framework and seeing uh, alignments and seeing where there's gaps or opportunities to, to adjust and use a framework. Which goes back to Emma's point earlier about how in the, for the adaptation projects, we're asking those submissions to specifically identify what elements of the framework um, are already addressed and which elements need to be, um, you're gonna be focusing your attention on. Oh, good question, Susan. Will the chat discussion be saved? Yes, Emma, we'll I, think, yes. I think you have that ability. We'll, yeah. um, we'll do our best. You're right, it's, <laughs> it's a rich, it's a very rich um, discussion. You can always call us though, Susan, if you ever, if you ever feeling like you, like you wanna follow up on something, we're, um, we're available. And all questions, you know, official questions about the EOI, um, you need to be sent through the procurement email box. And the purpose of that is to make sure that we're getting the responses out um, back to everybody um, in, a, in a fair manner. So please continue to use that mechanism. But if you want to chat about micro certs kind of, you know, more strategically or philosophically, like Michelle and I and Emma are always available to, um, to chat a little. We have a question from Debbie. Um, does issuing mean the students would have to have completed their learning? Um, no, I don't think so. I think Debbie, if you're if you have the micro cert uh, set and those students are and you and you've got you've done all the work to establish it in your program, um, then and you know that those students still need you know two or three months to finish up and you're going to be. Um, issuing them the micro certification upon completion of some activity or um, submission of evidence, then that is that is absolutely okay. We know you, that you're on the track. That's what's important to us. So Therese says um, she's understanding that the EOI should be made by the academic institution and that they would court an employer or to collaborate with, uh, with a view to obtaining that employer's endorsement. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. 
That is correct. And we're hoping that you can rely on, um, you know, some of the connections that you already have within your institution um, and some of the some of the resources that you already have on your on your campus. So Catherine asks, uh, does eCampus Intent prescribe a method of recognition, i.e. digital badge, or is one of the pilot objectives to explore various methods for recognizing completion of the training? Um, so, oh, so, sorry, Lena, I'm, I'm answering yeah. the chat at the same time. Well, go ahead. <laughs> oh, did I miss your answer? I'm just trying to scroll up so we don't miss any. You go ahead, Michelle. Can you, were you working on an answer for that one? No, I'm actually answering Amy's question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think, um, I think, Catherine, that um, we do not intend to prescribe a method of recognition. I mean, I, I think that our framework kind of uh, already lays as much groundwork in in that um, in stating what we what we would like to see recognized that's as far as we want to go in um, in setting any kind of parameters before um, our colleagues at the institutions have a chance to to test and see whether that makes any sense um, again so we're really trying to um, trying to take this practice drives policy approach. We need something to start with. And so that's why we built the framework and the principles um, with uh, people from the system. But, but we still recognize that that might need to be adjusted. So we are prescribing as little as possible and trying to just create the space um, for all of the creative um, people on this call to take it forward and, and, and make it work. Um, in their in this in the specifics of um, a higher ed institution, so I hope that helps. Um, yes, if it's not in the framework, um, we haven't made a statement about it yet, and we don't intend to until after the results of the pilot are complete. How many pro proposals? Um, that's really going to depend on um, which ones come through and um, what the numbers are. Uh, we have a limited amount of money and um, we will fund as many as we can with the money that we have available. Um, but because we're asking you for, uh, we've given you a max budget and we're asking you to report back to us on how much you might need based on the specifics of your project, we are expecting to have some variance in terms of those numbers. And so we can't say, um, we don't have a fixed number. We will just get as many in as we possibly can. Emma and Lena, question for you guys. Any limits on the length of the submission? I'm not sure if that was specified in the EOI itself. I mean, you guys created uh, templates. Yes. You, know, so you guys created did, templates. We did specify a length. I believe it was three pages, um, but I know it's in the EOI. So just refer back to that document for the correct answer. Yeah, and please, please keep it three pages. <laughs> if three pages was the maximum that we said, and I think it was. Yeah, I, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you find yourself going over three pages, um, you know, uh, maybe um, just just go back to that template and see see exactly what it is that we're asking from you. And it's and it's probably um, possible that that you are um, are going above and beyond the level of detail that we've asked for. So Julie is asking when access to the tool will be removed. Mm. Michelle. So yeah, so that's a, that's an interesting question. From from our perspective, the pilot runs until March thirty first. Um, I mean, it'll be part of the conversation with the vendor. I don't expect us to stop functionality on, on March thirty first. I expect the functionality to work beyond that. Um, it'll be it'll be part of the negotiations with the vendor. So in terms of the pilot, for, for from eCampus's perspective, the reporting on early activity um, has to happen before March thirty first access to the platform remains to be determined depending on which vendor we go forward with. I would say from a technical perspective, the majority of vendors work on yearly cycles. So that would be my expectation that the access would be for on a yearly cycle. But I mean, that still remains to be seen. We don't have a clear cut indication at this point in time on the length of it. Looks like Tara um, is asking whether or not 
all of the, whether or not uh, these questions will be saved? And the answer is yes. Um, I will figure out a way to save the chat and see if we can publish it as well on our website. And um, we are recording right now and that recording will be shared with everybody who registered for the webinar, as well as it'll be posted on that EOI page on our website. Um, so, oh, you're referring to emailed questions? Yeah, so we, uh, we did cover the questions that we received so far in the webinar. Um, the questions about uh, whether or not one institution can submit more than one proposal and the, um, the question about delivery method. So if we do get more emailed questions that are relevant to everybody, uh, yes, we will publish those. Um, there's a question from Teresa about whether we're collecting a list of employers who would be open to collaboration and who have a list of topics of interest to them. Teresa, if we had that, we would be, you know, we would be like the richest people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, it's a great question and, uh, and it's one we've been asked before. Um, because we have started um, this work, we do have some employers um, that are coming forward to say, hey, um, we wouldn't mind being a part of this. Um, the problem a little bit with this, you know, uh, eCampus Ontario has been asked to play this role before uh, as matchmaker. Um, we did it, um, we did it when, when we were um, funding online course development um, because people were asking for opportunities to collaborate um, across institutions. And although it was, uh, it was a widely requested function, um, it wasn't a function that was actually used that much um, when we were doing it. And so um, I, think it, I think if you have, if you're wondering, send us a message um, and we'll, we'll connect you with, with um, whomever we've heard from. But I don't think we'll be publishing anything like that um, at this time just because of the time constraints and also because really what it comes down to is, is probably your regional connections and, and the conversations that you have face-to-face -face, um, uh, with people in your orbit. Um, so playing that role for us is a tough one. I would love to do it, um, mm -hmm. but it's, but it's, it ends up, it ends up using up a lot of our time and not very many people use it. So, um, maybe, maybe next time, maybe going forward. So question from Debbie about releasing the funds for the, the EOIs or for the project. So my guess would be once an institution is selected, yeah. there would be a contract put in place at that point in time and the funds would flow down to the institutions pretty early in, in, in the project. That's right, Michelle. And I think it will probably be, um, there will be a holdback, a percentage that is held back um, based on submission of final deliverables because that is, um, that is what we were required to do um, as a broader public sector organization. Um, but yeah, I think that, we'll, you know, once once you're successful that that process will start uh, right away what are some of the benefits to employers for participating in this that's a great question <laughs> i mean i think that again i don't have a universal answer uh to that question um but but what we saw in the working group is from a lot of people is a genuine interest in in finding a better way uh, to hire. I know that, um, that here at eCampus Ontario, you know, if we post an entry-level job especially, uh, we get flooded with applications. And I think there's, there are a lot of small and medium-sized businesses especially, and the big ones too, because they just end up sending everyone through the automated systems, um, about, you know, not being able to sort through um, the number of applications that they get to find the person uh, that has the specific thing that they're looking for. So I think that this is an opportunity. If you're approaching an employer, I would start with yeah. their H HR department to talk to them about their hiring practices and then work backwards from there. Um, what kind of people are they looking for? What vacancies do they mm -hmm. have upcoming um, that they're worried about? So, so two things from mine. I think you're absolutely right, Lena. It's about smart recruiting practices and being able to have access to talent quicker. So building those, those, those functional talent pipelines. Uh, so I think that's where employers see the benefit is the ability for them to more quickly have access to talent. 
And also, I might add, and, and I don't know if this is if this is kind of quite in the consciousness yet, but if you have a micro certification, um, you know, bent at your institution, the idea is is that it's an ongoing conversation. We know that you know, skills in the tech industry, for example, have a shelf life of about five years. So how are we making sure that, um, that our programs and our, and our micro cert projects are refreshing to be current? Um, and I think uh, that is another benefit from their perspective is that it's not just a one and done kind of a thing. It, it can, like Michelle is, is signaling, it can start to build an, a pipeline that is also one that, um, that they can feed into um, as they see on the horizon um, the skills and competencies that they've identified that they need. Um, I know there's lots of inconsistency out there about what the, those skills and competencies are, but, but I think um, if you have an employer partner engaged, then through that conversation, it should, it should become clear. I think we answered all of them. Did we? Yeah, maybe no, are we a missing couple of them any? slipped in the cracks, but. Yeah, um, if, if your question slipped in the cracks, just retype it right now. I think we've, looks like we've. Yeah, I'm just scrolling up. Great questions. I'm yeah, so, awesome I am questions. so pleased to see all of these fantastic questions. And I hope that you're benefiting also from the questions that your colleagues are asking. Um, because this is, this is another, you know, benefit to doing these things together is that we have access to each other's um, problem solving abilities. Is it possible to have more than one industry yeah, partner sure. on certification? Yes. <laughs> that would be, that'd be fantastic. That'd be great. Yeah. We're talking this morning about currency, like how important it is, um, that 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 the work that you're doing has currency outside of your institution and so the more employers um that endorse um that micro certification project the more it will mean to your students because it's about options for them right it's about opening that door into the workforce um so so we we are we are recommending that you start small if that's what you need to do, um, but there's absolutely no limits on on kind of how how deep or how expansive this can go. Do we have any other questions? Yep. Oh, a bunch more came in. All right. So Carolyn asks, when outlining the competencies, are there specific phrasing that you expect, i.e. learning outcomes, competency lists, as well as KSB? What is KS? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Um, I'm, Knowledge, skills, and values. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, so in our framework, and this was a conversation that we had in the working group, um, and we wanted to leave the door open for people as much as possible. And we didn't feel as though we were ready as a province because we're so early on in this to kind of come down on any one um, specific uh, standard for um, language. Um, we did agree that harmonized skills and competency language is really important. Um, and we, we added um, the ESCO framework into our um, into our document as an example, um, but we didn't specify. Um, and so I think one of the things that we want to learn um, out of this this work with with you is um, is how to get closer to harmonized language. Um, Michelle, is there anything you want to add on that? No, I, I think you, you you're banging on. It's 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 really about that. Yeah. It is. So we don't have the answer um, to that right now. So there is nothing specific that, that we're expecting. Um, but, but we encourage you to look at other frameworks um, that are out there and start to, um, start to use some of that language if it resonates with you. 
and ESCO is a good example of one you can start with. So, so I'll, I'll answer April's question. April's question is about student data that gets stored on the digital platform we'll be using. And um, the fact that that evidence could be learned, uh, could be useful at, at a later time or needed at a later time. So we haven't yet selected a platform. That, that's something we want to specify the requirements for that platform with institutions participating in the pilot. So CanCred could be the way forward or it could be something else. So that, that remains to be defined. Uh, so to your question, I mean, there's different options. It could be residing in the platform or another option what's, what's been seen in the environment is that that, informant, that information sits on the blockchain and that's the way it gets stored. And once it's on the blockchain, then absolutely you can verify it at a later time. So there's, there's I mean, it's a, it's a pretty complex question. It really depends on where we want to go on, on, on the digital front. But those are kind of the options. Could be in the digital tool or could be on the blockchain. And we are not, we, we want to sit down with institutions to set those requirements before posting an RFU and finding the tech. So it's, it's really about the education and the needs of the institutions before selecting the technology. So I guess that question will, is, is, is interesting today, but will also be asked and be, be part of the conversation moving forward. So this is our invitation to you to join us in that process. And that's why we're calling it an expression of interest um, rather than a request for proposals um, because it is, it, is much, it, is, it is much more collaborative um, than, than a traditional uh, approach. So Emma, I think you have a couple more slides, right? Which have important yeah. information. So yes. why don't you go ahead and, and use those and we'll answer any questions that okay. come up as they go in the chat. Great. Um, so it's just about what's happening next. Um, so our, we expect to receive your applications by October 31st. Um, and then we will notify you by November 8th um, in, our, in our out there. We'll get them evaluated as quickly as we can and get those responses back to you. Um, and as Michelle was just saying, um, we really hope to engage you guys in conversations about technical requirements um, so that we can get that uh, vendor and uh, platform RFQ drafted. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to our website. Um, we've just posted an opportunity um, to conduct research on micro certification business models in higher education. I believe that um, RFQ closes on um, October 31st as well. And again, um, February 21st, 2020, save the date. It'll be our micro certification platform, uh, sorry, our micro certification forum uh, in Toronto. And we're gonna be announcing it at TESS and we'll get you all the information on how to register for that as well. Um, and I know that there are a few more questions. We have five more minutes left. If we wanna get to those questions, um, that's about it. I just want to add about the forum, um, Emma, that um, the, the institutions that, um, that participate in this pilot will be engaged in that forum um, in, in some way. So um, either it will be, well, it will probably likely be an opportunity to share um, the, the pilot that you've been working on, um, among other things. So, so if you are submitting a, a proposal, I really highly recommend that you pop that date in your calendar um, and keep it in there um, because it will be a full day and it'll be in Toronto. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to learning collectively from what we, um, what we uh, in explore in these pilots. Um, so there's a question from April about how do we suggest positioning this to the employer and students who will be engaging? I think it's a great question. Yeah, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle says, let's figure it out together. Uh, I think that's a great answer. I mean, I think that's, and I think that's a question that a lot of um, other people on the call are also asking them themselves. I mean, I think to, to everyone, um, if I were to start, this is about, um, this is about ensuring um, faster and, and more meaningful connections between post-secondary education and the workforce. Um, so to students and employers, I think on either end of that, um, that will be 
something of interest to them. Uh, for example, I was just talking to IBM the other day and um, in their project that they're doing with Mohawk for IBM Skills Academy, um, one of those students received a badge um, for, I think it's cybersecurity or something, um, and it's issued by IBM. She passed the test um, and she received the micro-credential and she posted it onto her LinkedIn profile. And the following day, she had 600 on her LinkedIn profile. Um, so that's really early example of what's possible, but that's what we're going for, right? That's what we're, th that's, those are the kinds of experiences that we're trying to generate for our students is opening those doors for them. Um, is the application in a set format or as creative as it can be within the page limit only? I mean, so we've provided you with a template um, just to make it easier for you to make sure you're hitting on all of the things that we're asking for. Um, but we love creativity. Uh, so as long as you, as, if you hit the points that we're asking you for and you stay within the page limit, um, then, you know, illustrate, um, do, do what you think best conveys your message. The template is on the website. So let me drop the link uh, into the chat. It's on our opportunities page. I'll just drop the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, it's under the EOI uh, opportunity, but yeah, Lena, it'd be great if you mm -hmm. drop So that's, yeah. that's the link to the opportunities page. And if you click on, uh, oops, that was the wrong one. If you click on the MicroCert Pilot EOI, which I will also drop in the chat. Ooh, does the three page limit include the budget template? <laughs> no, it does not. Great question, Tara. We should. Um, We'll publish that question. Publish that question. <laughs> um, and that uh, the link that Lena just dropped into the ch chat, that is where the link for this recording is going to live, um, hopefully by this afternoon, but we'll have to talk to our comms team about getting that up somehow. Um, and I'll also send out the link uh, in an email to everybody who registered as well, because I know a lot of people registered but weren't able to attend today. You guys asked great, great questions. Thank you, yeah, thank so, you so much. much. It's been great. We really are very excited uh, to see uh, what you what you come back to us with. This is yeah. just the beginning, I think, of a really um, exciting foray into this space, and um, and we're excited that that you are willing to Absolutely. jump in with us. And if you have any further questions, just send them to that procurement email address and we'll get back to you. All right, I think you can call it, Emma. Yeah, All right. thanks everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Awesome. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. So is that chat? Yeah, I see.